Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, welcome again to the series finale of Rooted. We have been cranking through the book of Colossians over the past eight weeks. And so we're in chapter four now, and we're about to wrap this up today. It's been an exciting journey. Man, we've seen a lot of incredible things happen. Uh, you know, I, th I think we've seen 10 people actually make decisions to follow Jesus Christ during this series that is just all about who Jesus is. Isn't that exciting? Um, yeah, and we got several of those folks already plugged into city groups. By the way, if you're not in a city group, we would love to get you connected in one. You can grab a connect card and just say, I'm interested in that. And we'll tell you what groups are available, what nights they meet and all that stuff. There's a place for everybody at Peak City. We launched eight city groups last month. Um, so for every phase of life that you're in, man, there's something for you. There really is. Uh, we want you to stay connected like that as well. Because it's one thing to say, I'm making a decision uh, to invite Christ into my life. It's another thing to become a follower of Jesus. And so that's why we use that language around here. We don't just say, hey, did you pray the prayer of salvation? No. At Peak City, what we do is we say, have you decided to become a follower of Jesus Christ? You know, and the whole point behind that is there's more to it than just fire insurance. This idea, oh, man, I prayed, I'm good. You know, but rather a relationship that grows in Jesus, and it's based on what he has done for you. So I'm not going to preach a separate sermon today, uh, but just a short recap. In Colossians, basically what we saw in the first two chapters was Paul, the apostle who wrote this letter, reaching out to a brand new church that he'd never been to before that was planted by a guy uh, that came to follow Christ under Paul's ministry. And his name was Epaphras. Epaphras planted this church in this town called Colossae. It's in modern day Turkey. And Paul, who was in prison, in chains at the time, wrote a letter to this church in Colossae, and he sent that letter probably 1,180 miles from a Roman jail cell all the way to this church in Colossae because he heard that false teachers were sneaking into the church. He heard that people were trying to tack on extra things to the gospel. They were trying to say, Jesus is great, but really to be saved, you need Jesus plus something. And Paul basically wrote this letter to say, Jesus plus anything is not the gospel. Christ is is enough. Pretty cool when we, when we sing the songs that actually match the theme of what we're preaching today, amen? Yeah, so Paul took us through two chapters, almost two and a half chapters of that, you know, saying Jesus is enough, Jesus is enough, Jesus is enough. Don't believe the Judaizers. Those were the people that said you had to basically be Jewish and believe that Jesus was the Messiah to be saved. He said, it's not true. Christ is enough. He said, don't believe the Gnostics. There are people that say that it's Jesus plus this special spiritual knowledge that only the Gnostics can tell you about. And they, can't, they don't even really know what that is, but they say that they do. But you need that special knowledge to unlock salvation. And Paul said, that's a lie. That's completely untrue. All you need is Christ. He is the preeminent one. He is the all-sufficient one. He is the complete sacrifice that basically takes the grace of God and puts it on anybody that would receive what Jesus did at the cross and believe that he was resurrected from the dead. So that was the first two chapters. And then we got into chapter 3 and started talking about life. Uh, he basically started saying, hey, this is how now that Christ has transformed you, you ought to live. And so he gives us instructions for the way we treat other people, uh, for the way that we treat the places that we work in and our coworkers and our bosses and the people that are in charge over us, how we respond to the stuff that we don't want to do, that we have to do, right? And then he even goes as far as to say marriage relationships and parenting. This is the way that ought to look. And if you want to catch any of those messages, just head over to Peak City dot church forward slash messages by the way if you're watching online we want to welcome our online community we're so glad that you're checking us out here and we hope that this message is a blessing to you so we're going to pray and we're going to jump into this final portion of scripture in colossians father i ask that you would speak through me your servant today that your gospel would be proclaimed that you would move us as a people lord to do more than just being hearers but put us into action as only you can because there is a world that is in desperate need of the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my prayer is today that you would give us the hearts of evangelists that just say, I might not have all the answers, but I know the Holy Spirit can use me to share the love of Jesus with somebody. God, let us have that kind of heart today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
We're going to jump right into the scripture today. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 4. If you've got your Bibles, you can open those up. If you've got your Bibles on your phone or your iPad like I do today, you can actually open that up as well. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, it's in the New Testament, so you've got to kind of go. And basically, it's, all, it's almost towards the back of the Bible if you were just to open it up. You'd find in that last little uh, eight or so of scripture, you find Colossians. So we're going to read this together. Paul says this. We're going to start reading in verse 2 because verse 1, he was just basically saying, he was doubling down on, hey, you know, masters, be kind to your servants. Uh, and then he jumps into this passage here. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Now, let me just clear this up here. The mystery of Christ is not a mystery. I think most of you, if you went through the Ephesians series with us and this series, you know that the mystery of Christ is that now God is welcoming the whole world into relationship with him, that we can all be a part of the covenant. The Gentiles are now welcomed through what Christ has done at the cross, and that was the mystery revealed. It wasn't just for the Jews anymore. It wasn't just for the nation of Israel to believe and be saved, but rather that through Christ that the world, John 3, would be saved. If you're tracking with me, say, "Uh uh-huh. So Paul says he wants to declare that mystery on account of which I am in prison. Think about this for a second. Paul reveals to us why he was charged. A lot of you are like, well, why was Paul in prison? We don't really know. Yes, we do. Paul tells us in the book of Colossians, he says, because I am preaching the gospel, because I am saying that Jesus is king of kings and Lord of lords, that is an affront to Caesar, the one that wants to say that he is king of kings and he is Lord of lords. Remember the phrase that we see in the book of John, no name under heaven through which men might be saved but the name of Jesus, right? We proclaim that. You know where that came from? Paul was just saying, yes, Caesar, really? Check this out. Because the phrase at the time was no name above any other name than the name of Caesar through, when, through which men might be saved. And John said, mm-mm, we're going to correct that. And that became a banner cry for us as believers. And so we see Paul saying this very thing. I am boldly proclaiming that Christ is all and in all. Do you realize as we've gone through this letter of Colossians, let it sink into your mind. The amount of times that we have, said, we have seen Paul declare, Jesus is the preeminent one. He is the Lord over all creation, over anything, living, dead, anything. He is it, King of kings and Lord of lords. And see, that was a direct affront to the Roman government. So they put Paul in prison. And, you know, and he is a citizen, um, you know, for treason can be executed. Paul was a Roman citizen. He was a born free citizen in the city of Tarsus. And so he was born as a Roman citizen with Roman rights, which just meant you can be, you can be killed for treason, but we won't crucify you for it, basically. That's what they, they will cut your head off or we'll do something else, but we won't crucify you. And he is in prison for that reason. He says, that I might make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Don't gloss over that. So what is Paul praying for here? Praying for a jailbreak. He said, no, somebody quick, bake a pie, put a nail file in it. And I don't even know if they had this back in the day. Is that what he's praying? Is he praying, somebody just spring me out, you know, dynamite. We'll figure out how to make it. It doesn't come around for another couple thousand years, but we'll try something. No, that's not what Paul's praying for. Is he praying... You know, just pray for me uh, that the guards would be nicer to me or that the food would be better or that these prison clothes are not so nasty. No, he doesn't do any of that. He says for us, while he is in chains in prison, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Where is he going to declare it? In prison. He is saying, pray that God opens doors for me to witness to the people that have me in chains. That is the heart of the Apostle Paul. And that is what he is challenging us today to be able to understand. Now, some of you, you might have some people in your life that you just don't like, you feel shackled to. And you wish that God would just break the shackle off. Or you wish that God would just chop the arm of the person that shackled to you off so you can just walk away. You don't even care, right? You just, I want out. But if you follow the example of the Apostle Paul, he's saying you pray for those people, that God would open up doors for your life 
to be a reflection of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that a door might open to share the word of God, the truth with somebody that might be transformed by him. You see, the purpose of prayer, and we often misconstrue this because we pray for our own comforts, don't we? Remember uh, about a month and a half, actually two months back, we were going through the Jesus and We series, and I asked the question. I said, if Jesus answered every single one of your prayers that you prayed this week, what would the world look like? Would it be the case that orphan children would be adopted from orphanages, that cancer would not exist anymore, that poverty would be eradicated, the idea of a school shooting would not even exist anymore, heartbreak and tragedy would flee the world? Is that, is that what the world would look like if God answered every single one of your prayers with a yes this week? Or would your prayer look a little different, and the results of that meaning that your 401k is doing really good, that you have lots of money in the bank, that all of a sudden you're not so cellulite back here anymore because you've been praying, God, could you help clear up the cellulite, that people like you more, that your life is more comfortable, that it's all about you. What, what does it look like for you? What does your prayer life look like if God answered every single one of your prayers this past week with a yes? I'm not saying don't pray for yourself. I'm not saying don't pray for the people close to you. Absolutely do that. If you hear me saying that, say amen. I'm not contradicting myself, though, because I'm saying if you're not also praying for the needs of the world, for the lost, for the broken, for the people that truly cannot help themselves, then you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. Because the purpose of prayer is not to get our will done in heaven. The purpose of prayer is to get heaven's will done on earth. Man, thank you. That one. All right. It's okay to say amen. I know it's early, but I like it when you, when you talk back to me a little bit. It helps, okay? The idea is not thy will, it's not why my will be done, but rather thy will be done. When we pray, that's the purpose in it. And Paul is modeling this for us in this passage of Scripture. Why? Because if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, it's simple. Followers fish. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, followers fish. It doesn't mean you have all the answers. It doesn't mean that you can just walk somebody right down the Roman road and give them every passage of Scripture so that they know exactly what they must do to be saved. But it is as simple as you know in the basics and you being a witness as to what Jesus has done in your life. You can even approach it by saying, man, I may not have all the answers, but just let me tell you what Christ has done in my heart. Guess what you're doing then? You're fishing. You're letting your life be a reflection of Christ, and you're offering a witness of what Christ has done in your life. Now, look, there's a lot of reasons why people don't take this approach that Paul has, where he's just hungry for people to know Jesus. Paul is so hungry. I mean, think about what's happened to this guy. Paul, he was beaten. Uh, he was arrested several times. I mean, he was shipwrecked twice. This guy was stoned. Uh, and not the kind that you're thinking, by the way. Sanctify that mind, all right? He had rocks that were thrown at him, and they were trying to kill him with those rocks, okay? He had all this stuff happen. He was, when he was shipwrecked on an island, a viper jumped out of the fire and bit him on the hand, and he just, like, shook it off. At that point, I would have been like, come on! Like, what in the world? But he never stopped. He never stopped pursuing people with the hope that only comes in Jesus Christ. Why? Because if you follow Jesus and Jesus really has done something in your life, it is the single most transformational thing that you'll ever experience. It should be the greatest thing that's ever happened to you. And if you don't want to tell somebody about the greatest thing that ever happened to you, guess what? It's not. It's not the greatest thing that ever happened to you. But it should be. Think about it this way. If you went and bought a scratcher, a scratch-off ticket at the Circle K, and all of a sudden you hit big and you want $100,000, it does not matter who you're talking to. I don't care if it's your mama. I don't care if it's your kid's school teacher. I don't care if it's your next-door neighbor, the postman, the person at the counter at the next convenience store that you go to. You will find a way to work into the conversation, man, I want $100,000 on a scratch card. Why? Because it's a good thing that you want to share with somebody else, right? Why then, if the most precious, the most valuable thing that has ever happened in our lives, the rescuing of our souls by Jesus Christ, why then is that not something that we want to find a way to share with somebody? Like, I'm not saying bombard people. I'm not saying get a Bible like mine that's so big you could fight crime with it and smack someone over the head with it. You know, I'm not saying any of that. But I'm saying... 
Why in the world won't we say, God, my desire is that my life would be a platform for someone to know you? I want the way I live and the way I speak to be a reflection of who you are. And I want to pray that the Holy Spirit would tell me when opportunities come up that I might be able to share that good news with somebody else. Why can't we get on that page? Did you hear that? There's a very different approach there. We're going to talk more about that as we work through the text today. There's a lot of reasons why people don't do this. There's a lot of reasons why people don't share their faith, and I want to talk about those. The first one that stands out in people's mind, I'm just going to say this. It's fear. It's fear. Straight up fear. And I see some heads nodding. That's right, because you have this just consternation in your heart. Like, you fear that you're going to do it wrong. You fear that you're going to offend someone. You fear that you're going to make this relationship or friendship awkward if you share your faith in Christ with somebody. But I want you to think about this for a second. Who is being rejected if someone doesn't accept Christ when you share about what Jesus has done in your life? You? No. Jesus is the one that's being rejected, not you. It's Christ. Think about it. Luke 10, 16 says it this way. It says, the one who hears you hears me. And the one who rejects you rejects me. And the one who rejects me re rejects him who sent me. They're not rejecting you if you act in obedience and you share. The Bible says that some people just won't believe, but it's not your duty to figure out who you think will and who you think won't. And you'll say, well, these guys probably won't, so I'm just going to leave those alone. And I'm going to head over to these easy targets and a low-hanging fruit over here. No. If the Holy Spirit prompts your heart and you see an open door to share something, even if it's just, man, God's been so good to me. Even if that is the only step that you can take towards Jesus in that conversation and you're obedient to that, God can use that in ways that you have no idea. Think about it. The most powerful men in the world, some of them we've seen them surrender their entire life to Jesus Christ. Uh, Rockefeller, our nation's first billionaire. The man who said when he was asked, how much money is enough now that you're a billionaire? How much is enough? He said, just a little bit more, right? Right? That kind of heart that was so driven towards what he could get was transformed by the gospel. You know how? Because somebody took the time to try to share it with him. It doesn't matter who it is, how far from God you think they are, how powerful, how meek, how poor, how strong, how angry, how scary. It does not matter. When the Holy Spirit speaks, we need to act. Let me ask you a question. Is it your responsibility to convert someone? We don't use that word a lot, do we? You already know the answer. It's not. It's not. Hey, Peak City Church, we say this a lot. It is not your job to make someone holy. You hear me? It is not your job to make someone holy. It is your job to love people and point them towards Jesus. And it is the job of the Holy Spirit to bring about a life change inside someone's heart, not yours. We lead them to the water. We lead them to Christ. And everything that we do and we say, we point people to Jesus. And we believe and trust that he is the one that's going to bring that transforming power. It's his job not ours. Romans 10, 14. I mean, we see that and it's telling us how Christ uses us to build his kingdom when we proclaim Jesus to others. John 6, 44, remember this. It says that no one can actually come to Christ unless he's drawn by the Father. He's drawn by the Holy Spirit. So it's his job to do this, but it's our job to act in obedience when God opens the door for us to share. Because he wants to use us to be a part of communicating his truth with people and seeing their hearts drawn to him. Another fear, another reason why people don't share their faith is because they don't know what to say. They just don't know what to say. I mean, think about it this way. We, we've said this before. Evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. That's the idea of sharing your faith. This word evangelism just means to share your faith. It's from the root word good news. In the Greek, it's euangelion. Uh, literally, evangelism is just good news, sharing the good news. You're just pointing somebody where to find the bread. That's what you're doing, man. You're pointing people towards the life source, leading them to the water. But it's not your job to make them drink it. Think about it that way. I mean, now, we, we've broken it down before, and I've tried to get this really, really simple for you and for me. Because the easiest way I can tell you to share the gospel with someone is through the gospel within the gospel. 
You know, John 3 is one of the simplest expressions of the whole gospel that we see in verse form. John 3, 16, we all know it. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Like, we've heard that. If you've been in church or you've been a Christian for a while, you've heard that the entire time you've been a believer. If you're new to church, that verse should say it all for you. If you're curious about what we believe, if you're curious about what Jesus has done for us, he loved the world so much that he, God, gave his only son. Jesus laid his life down that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And we break it down even simpler like this. If you can memorize that verse, you can share the gospel. Because it goes like this. We say God loved, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have or receive eternal life. So say it with me. God loved, God gave, we believe, we receive. If you want to know how to share the gospel with someone, write those four little fragments of sentences down. And you can share the gospel. You can share the truth of the word of God with somebody. You see, what we do is we make it simple and we help people understand that what we believe isn't, this, isn't just like a bunch of stories in a book. I'm here to tell you today, my faith is not based in the Bible. Did you know that? The Bible is a collection of reports that were inspired by the Holy Spirit of what actually happened. My faith is based not just in the Bible. My, ba my faith isn't based in a story. My faith is based in an event that a very real Jesus really came to this earth, born of a virgin, really lived a perfect life without sin, and truly took that life and said, I'm going to lay it down freely as a sacrifice for all of the world, sin to be forgiven, past, present, and future, that whosoever believes in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That is what I believe. My faith is based in an event. It's in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. My faith is based in something that happened. It's a true moment in history that changed the world. Without that, this is pointless. Without the resurrection, this is pointless. If you sit here today and say, well, I believe that Jesus died for me, and that's personal to my heart, and I love that, but you don't believe that he actually physically rose from the dead, your faith is in vain. Because all he did was die for you. He proved nothing. Then he's just a man like you or me, a good man, a wise teacher. But the fact that he did not stay dead, that as Colossians says, that he became the firstborn among the dead. In other words, the first one to rise from the dead again and never die again. Because of that and that alone, we have hope for salvation for us and for the entire world. We have good news. Some of us, we say we don't know what to say. Some of us say that we're waiting for the perfect time. Some of us say we are just waiting for the perfect time to share. Well, guess what? I mean, maybe you're at work and you hear your coworker say, man, the benefits of this office just stink. And they look at you and say, why are you so happy all the time? And all of a sudden, ding, 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 ding. You get excited. You're like, here it is. Anybody ever play football? Football players in the house, anybody? Okay, so both of us. You ever remember on defense, like when, when the running back was coming through and the hole opened up and it just happened to be in your section of cover on the field and you start running straight for that hole because you know you're about to eat somebody's lunch, like how excited you get, like woo woo! I'm preaching to three people right now, okay? We got really excited about that, man. An open field tackle, it just doesn't happen all the time and you're just gonna exploit that hole, right? You see an event like this where a coworker says to you, man, everything about this place just stinks, but why are you so happy all the time? All of a sudden, all of a sudden, it's wide open. It's set up on the rim. It's ready for you just to break it off for the basketball fans. I'm going to use sports analogies until it connects with somebody in the house today. Like You want to share, right? You see that perfect moment, and then all of a sudden you say, man, it's because of Jesus. And then that person's like, wow. Can I have a relationship with Jesus too? And you're like, well, of course. And then you say, well, bow your head. I'm going to pray with you. You just repeat after me. And then all of a sudden your boss comes in and he's like, hey, man, I need you to go clean the toilets because the janitor couldn't come in today. Uh, and by the way, to the person that hated work, uh, you're getting a raise and I'm going to actually make you that person's boss today. So congratulations. And we're going to boost your 401k and walks out the door. So the whole moment shot, right? 
Well, my little funny story, or one that was funny to me when I wrote it, clearly not that great to you, uh, was, <laughs> was illustrating this idea that there is no perfect time to share with somebody. But while there's no perfect time, there is a right time. I mean, seriously, like, think about it. If you're waiting for the stars to align before you help somebody realize that he or she is a sinner in need of God's grace, that's like saying that you're going to buy a MacBook when they below, drop below $500. Got news for you. It ain't going to happen. Like, never. Not in this lifetime. You will never share if you're waiting for everything to be perfect. But besides looking for a perfect moment, there are right moments. People see evangelism as something that you do. Change that mentality. Don't see evangelism just as something that you do. See, that's like, if, how many people were Christians back in the 90s? 90s Christians? Wave at me. Christians, uh, Christ followers, maybe even back in the 80s, wave at me. All right, so for the ones that were waving and you're like, what are these people waving about? Man, evangelism looked different back then. They used to tell you, you had to do this thing called evangelism explosion, which meant that we had to go like door to door, knocking on doors and trying to cold contact, share our faith with people. A lot of slam doors, lots of just really awkward conversations, but that was how we thought we did evangelism. Listen, we need to know how to share our faith. We need to know how to do that when those opportunities present themselves. So I'm not saying all that was bad. I think the approach was really awful. But the content, what we were learning in terms of how to share our faith was very good. We need to know how to do it. But listen, it doesn't need to be seen as something that we do. We need to see evangelism as who we are. It needs to just be a platform. Our life needs to be a platform in which the gospel can be shared. In other words, when people see our life and see the difference there, and when the door gets opened and we're praying for the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what those moments are like where we can share, that we do it, that we act in obedience, that we don't go, I don't know about this one. I'm just going to shrug it off, Lord. You know, I kind of feel it, but yeah, it's just going to be a little weird. No, don't do that. Come back and say yes to God. Think about it. Every effort that brings a non-Christian a step closer to surrendering his life to Christ is evangelism. Even if it's an act of loving service in Jesus' name. Even if it's just a cup of cold water for somebody that needs it. Even if it's just, I saw you needed help, I wanted to help you. Even if it's, I'm just going to take a moment to say something good that God's done in my life. Even if it's not or never is, let's pray together. You're ready. I'm going to walk you into a relationship with Jesus. Every step that we take towards him, every moment that we try to share our life and our faith with someone will move them a step closer, and that is evangelism. Every invitation you give somebody to come to church, because if you invite them here to this church, guess what they're going to hear about? They're going to hear the gospel. Make no mistake about it, every Sunday we come here, we're going to preach the cross, Christ crucified and resurrected, because if we don't, what's the point? A bunch of self-help, pop psychology, mumbo-jumbo stuff is not going to change anybody's life. Again, that's just chasing the effects, man. That's trying to fix the circumstances that have gone awry in someone's life, but it never fixes the heart condition. And there will never be any lasting change for anyone unless their heart is gripped and transformed by the Holy Spirit of God through what Jesus Christ has done for us through his cross and resurrection. That's why we do it. Don't wait for the perfect time. Some of us are just unwilling. Some of us are just unwilling to be uncomfortable. That's another reason why we don't share our faith. I mean, think about it. In our society right now, you can talk about sex. That's fine. Talk about it all you want to. You, I mean, la ladies all over Instagram can expose their bodies, and people don't think like another thing of it. Guys do it, and it's just really weird. And not that it's not that weird when girls do it. It's just weirder even more so when guys just, y'all, put, put the V-neck away, okay? I mean, something. I'm sorry. I'm not preaching at you guys today. You're, you're wonderful people. Uh, clean up your Instagram accounts. Anyway, so you can talk about that. You can expose your bodies. You can tell dirty jokes. You can do all that stuff. But if you want to tell somebody about Jesus, whoop, you cross the line, right? Think about it. That's the society that we're living in. If we bring Jesus up, we feel like we have so much to lose. Like, what's my friend going to say? What if my coworkers stop inviting me to the office parties? Like, we ask ourselves all the time, how much do I have to lose to tell others about Jesus? And then our focus is all of a sudden shifted to our losses rather than what we gain by sharing Christ with somebody. You know, that's the same trap that Eve fell into in the book of Genesis. What happened? 
right? The serpent came along. Eve was living large. She had the garden. She had anything she wanted. She wasn't going to die. Her, her clothes were clean every day because she didn't have to have any. She was naked, not ashamed. She had Adam. She had to help me. Everything was good, right? God said that, that, that particularly Adam and Eve, that was very good in terms of creation. Had it all, and the serpent came and said, hey, but guess what you're missing out on? Just one little thing over here, you know? So if you really had that, then you'd, you'd really have everything. And what she thought she was missing out on ended up being the destruction of her life, a curse befalling all of the world because she didn't want to miss out on something. And she was more focused on what she was losing rather than what she actually had. Stop focusing on what you think you might lose because what you have is the hope of heaven. And what they don't have is the hope of heaven. If you walked out in front of a bus today and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, man, guess what? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Father. You go to be with him in eternity. But someone that doesn't know Jesus that you know and care about, but you've just been waiting for the perfect moment, can walk in front of that bus and they die. And without Christ, they go to hell. And that's not a message any of us want to hear, but that's certainly not something that we want to have happen to the people that we care about. In this world, I see souls. I don't just see faces anymore. I consciously walk the streets and pray for people in our city. And I do that with a heart that says, God, I don't know if their soul's been rescued, but just I open a door. God, I pray that you would allow me to find a way. Use me to be a part of that something, God. I, I, I desperately pray for people to know Jesus Christ, because without him, there is no hope. Some of us don't share our faith because we feel disqualified. Some of us just feel disqualified. Listen, this is a lot of us. You say, oh, man, pastor, you didn't know what I was doing last night. I'm not in a position to share my faith at all, you know? We say this at Peak City. You're welcome here. We're so glad you're here. We don't care what you look like. We don't care uh, how much money you have or don't have. We don't care about, you know, what, what your skin color is. We don't care about any of those things, socioeconomic economic demographics. We are one family in Christ. And we'll go as far as to say for anybody in the house, we don't care what you smell like. We don't care what you smell like from what you did last night. If you can get here, you're in the right place. Because at the end of the day, we believe that the church should be a hospital for the sick, not some museum for the quote-unquote godly. And this is who we want to be. If you feel disqualified, I want to share this with you. You don't have to be the poster kid for Christianity to share your faith. Who was the first evangelist that we see in the New Testament? Some of you might have an answer. Just hold it. I'll tell you. I believe the first evangelist that we see in the New Testament was the woman at the well in Samaria. Remember? She was not living a, a, exactly squeaky clean, holy life. Like, that woman was considered to be the very first evangelist. When Jesus found her at the well, she was shacking up with a man that wasn't even her husband. She was obviously flunking sainthood at the time, wasn't she? But after Jesus called her to repent and place her faith in him, she was transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then what did she do? She went and ran into town and said, come see a man who told me everything about me that I have ever done. You are not gonna believe this. She pointed people to Jesus, and that is what God is calling us to do. I don't care how broken or hurt you, you are. If you are a follower of Christ, if you believe that Jesus has rescued your soul, you can point people to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Listen, I got a lot to say today, and there's no way I'm going to be able to say it. <laughs> so we're going to start landing this plane now. I want you to know from my heart to yours that sharing your faith is something that you can do. Like, this isn't something that's beyond your reach. This isn't something that's just for others to do. This is something for us. If you're a Christ follower, we find a way to do this. At Peak City, we believe this so passionately that we try to make it easy. Why? We, that's why we do things like the Easter egg hunt, where you can invite children and families to come to an Easter egg hunt. And guess what? Maybe they'll get around other Christians and say, wow, these people aren't so crazy after all, you know? Because for centuries, people have thought Christians were nutso. Did you realize in the early church that, that, uh, that the Roman emperors before Constantine, you know, the reason they tortured and, and did all these terrible things to Christians was because they bought into a lot of the rumors that circulated about Christians, in fact, there was, there was this one governor over a province, and his name was, was Pliny, Pliny the Younger, and he was tasked 
to go and get Christian people and question them and torture some of them to find out what they were really all about. And then the emperor said, not only do that, but also send spies to follow them so that we can get a real look at their life. And here was the report that came back. Pliny, the, the younger, what he said was, they gather together and they sing expressively to God. In other words, he was saying, it's like they're lifting their hands and they're singing to God together. Someone shares something about, he said, Christus, about Christ. And then they leave the gathering and they go to homes and they eat together. But it is innocent food. Do you know why Pliny said that in his report? It's because the rumor was circulating that Christians ate people. Literally, they said, these people eat babies. That's what they do. Why? Because it came from when Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. And so that got misconstrued from this idea of breaking the bread and pouring the wine and sharing together in holy communion. And it got turned into this horror film. Like, it's not the walking dead. This is what Pliny said. We don't need to keep on killing these guys and rounding them up. In fact, he said, if we continue to round these citizens up, it is my belief that you will take all of the best citizens of Rome and arrest them. You see, the difference, that the, the rumors that have always circulated have been crazy about Christianity. The only way that we can dispel that is if we go and be among people that don't believe. God did not call us to live in these Christian enclaves of like, hey, I've just got my little believers over here, and I don't know anybody at all that's not a Christian. Well, how are you ever going to share your faith? I got caught in this trap, I got, and I'm going way off my notes right now, guys. So you can just throw the rooted slide up there, and that'll be fine, okay? I got caught in this trap when I was in ministry. I found myself when I was 23 years old in a ministry position that so consumed all of my time that I never had time to connect with or be around people that weren't Christians, except when I was at the gas station or, you know, or at a restaurant or something like that. And I tried to leverage small opportunities like that as best I could, but there was no relationship being built. So you know what I did? I started a rock and roll band. That's what I did. I started a rock and roll band. We started playing clubs. Actually, what I first did was I started playing at open mic nights just to get out around people that didn't believe, like just so I could be around them. Maybe I could build some relationships. And all of a sudden, this guy was like, I want to play with you. I'll, I'll play music with you. And then all of a sudden, I had a band, and, and things started kind of taking off unexpectedly. And we started playing all the rock clubs in the Triangle and, and in the, like a three-state region for a little while there. And that gave us an opportunity and a platform to share our life and our faith with other people in a way that wasn't like, get away from me, you social disease, but it was attractional to them. They actually saw something that didn't look so unfamiliar in somebody that professed to put all their faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ. And it got easy, man. When you're sitting around talking to some of these guys and they start passing drugs around, you're like, you know, I'm good. But you keep the conversation going with them. By the way, I wouldn't recommend going into a situation like that by yourself. The Bible says send them out in groups of two. If you're going to go into situations like that where there's, you know, things that you could struggle with, substances, uh, like if you're going to minister to prostitutes and things like that, just take a, take a person with you for accountability and go do that. And go do that. And go do that. Because why? It's what Jesus did. I didn't let the limitations that I had set on me in ministry keep me from reaching other people. I said, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do? I'm going to say yes. God is calling us to do the exact same thing today. Church, don't miss this. The whole point of Love Week is not just so we can be nice. It is so that people see our good deeds and they will glorify our Father who is in heaven. It is Matthew 5, 16, and we are going to ride that train as hard as we can because we would desperately want people to know how good God is. And listen, we have made it as easy as we know how to make it. Like, Froyo night. All you got to do is say, hey, you guys want some free Froyo? Uh, it's, it's on the house from 6 to 7 p.m. My church is sponsoring everybody that comes to the door. And just connect with people and just talk to people and just share somebody's, some of your story. How about this even better? If you don't know how to talk to people, all you got to do is bring up the other person's favorite subject, themselves. That's all you got to do. Start asking people questions about themselves, and they'll want to talk about that. And as you connect in relationship and that conversation is flowing, just ask God, hey, is there going to be a moment here where I can just share my faith, where I can share something good that you've done in my life, just that simply? doesn't mean you have to win the game. Don't come into conversations with people thinking, if I don't get them on their knees praying the sinner's prayer, then it's no good. That's not the point. 
It is not your job to try to rescue every, every single person that comes to the door and bring it to completion and win, win the game like that. Paul himself said, I planted the seed, Apollos watered the seed. Somebody else came along and watered the seed, but God gave the increase. It's God's job to save, not yours. But we're doing this whole thing. Throw the Love Week slide up there if you can, guys, in the back, if you can find that. The whole point of what we're doing during Love Week is just to give opportunities to, to be able to share Christ with others, even if it's just through showing people that our life is marked and different because of Jesus. Every single opportunity we've given is something that everybody here can do. It is not an impossible task. This is something that your children can do with you, no matter how young or how old they are. The reason we're doing this is because we believe it. This is the way we're leading as a church, and we want people to know Jesus Christ. We have one of the easiest opportunities for you to share Christ with somebody that you'll ever find in the calendar year coming up this Sunday. If you ask, people will come. Man, remember the statistics of all the people that aren't here today. The statistics say over half of the people that aren't in church right now would come if someone invited them. Would you invite them? In fact, what if, what if I gave you something to make it a whole lot easier to invite them? I think that's what we'll do today. We as a church, we've gone and purchased $5 Chick-fil-A gift cards for every single adult that shows up today. And we're gonna give these to you with a Love the Triangle card and with an invite card for Easter where you can go to someone, a friend, a neighbor, to anybody that, that isn't in church that you want to just reach out to and say, hey, I got a gift for you. Like Chick-fil-A? Who doesn't like Chick-fil-A? It is delicious, right? Besides the fact that it is Christian chicken anointed by God, that it is blessed in the light of the seven, praise his holy name. It is food not of the split hoof, but of a winged bird that flies into your hearts and into your mouth. I can preach about Chick-fil-A, people. It's something that people want. What we believe is that we can give them something like that that they want because I know there's something they'll want even more, whether they know it or not. And it's not a bait and switch. You're giving them something good in the hopes that they're going to come and receive something even better. Would you do it? I got skin in the game here. I want you to as well. So for anyone that's willing to do that, when you leave today, and we're not done yet, but before you get out of here, we're going to have our ushers standing at the back, and they're going to have these gift cards for you. They're going to have a Love the Triangle card that you can use anytime during Love Week. And if you, don't, if you want more Love the Triangle cards, we've got them. Get as many as you want. And then we'll also have Easter invite cards. And if you want more than one, just ask. We'll get you more. But you can give that gift card and the Easter invite card to someone and say, we'd love to have you this Easter. Here's a little gift from us. We're a brand new church in Apex. And that's all you got to do. And if that seed gets planted and somebody shows up because of that gesture of love and kindness, Jesus Christ absolutely can transform their life just because you took a moment to invest a little bit of time. And we as a church invested a little bit of our money because we believe that this earthly stuff, this money that just comes and goes, is worthless in the grand scheme of things. It's eternity that we're concerned about. I want you to pray with me right now.